Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today at what will be the first of a series of webinars on international law um, careers, with the first one being on, on private practice. Um, and I, I th thank you all for taking the time, I'm sure, which is your lunch break, <laughs> to, to join us here today. Um, we just off the top, um, if you have any questions that you would like to pose um, to the speakers, please use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen towards the right of the record button. Um, you can pose any questions um, there that you might have. Um, so as mentioned, this is the first um, in a series of webinars that the new professionals interest group of ASIL um, has launched um, and future Sessions will be on government attorneys, careers with NGOs, um, careers in, with international organizations and in academia. And we would love to hear from you um, if you have any other suggestions of uh, careers panels that you'd like to see throughout the year. Um, just quickly, I'd like to thank my team at, with um, the New Professionals Interest Group for helping put this together. And then also Taylor Kilpatrick and James Steiner from ASIL um, that helped with the technical aspects. And then, of course, our three speakers um, that have taken time out of what I'm sure is busy schedules uh, to join us to join us here today. Um, so I just quickly like to give a short introduction um, of our speakers, and um, I'll start with alphabetical order. So Anna Amador from what is quite a mouthful, Curtis Mallet Provost, um, Colton Mosel. I hope I pronounced all those correctly. <laughs> um, <laughs> did I? <laughs> um, advises foreign governments and enterprises in a number of US trade remedy proceedings before the US Department of Co Commerce and the US International Trade Commission. As part of the international trade team at Curtis, she has also been involved in several US Court Appeal and World Trade Organization dispute settlement cases and anti-dumping and counter evading duty issues. And also provides advice on sanctions, which have included sanctions regimes in, on Iran, Russia, China, Cuba, as well as the EU's blocking statute. She has also been involved um, in, and her experience extends to antitrust, European Union state aid, regulatory issues, international litigation and compliance matters, um, especially in the area of anti-money laundering. Prior to joining Curtis, Anna worked as an international trade and antitrust lawyer in a number of boutique firms in Brussels. Um, and she began her career in the public sector, working as an assistant to a member of the European Parliament. She reg uh, regularly lectures on EU law and frequently participates in academic programs on international litigation and advocacy. Anna holds two LLMs. Um, one from the New York University School of Law in Competition, Innovation and Information Law, and from the Freie Universität Brussels in International and European Law. Now, moving on to Shika Singh, um, who is, in, in council and is a council and member of the International Dispute Resolution Group at Debevoir and Plimpton. Prior to joining the firm, she was a Forrester Fellow at the Tulane University uh, Law School. And from 2011 to 2015, she was an attorney advisor in the office at the legal advisory at the US Department of State, where she advised the department on various legal issues relating to military operations, counterterrorism, and diplomatic security. She has also represented the United States before multilateral bodies and coordinated with the Interagency on International Legal Claims in Guantanamo Military Commission prosecutions and other federal cases. Ashika received superior and meritorious honor awards from the State Department for her work on Guantanamo detainee issues and human rights and armed conflict. Before joining the State Department, Ashika worked as an international litigation arbitration, arbitration associate with the International Law Firm in New York. Ashika obtained her JD Magna Cum Laude from New York University School of Law in 2015, and she also received a McCoy in International Relations from the University of Cambridge in 2002 and an AB Magna Cum Laude from Harvard College in 2000. Ashika also regularly speaks and writes on public international law, particularly international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Last but not least, um, Zachary Cady is an associate in the New York office of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher and a member of Gibson, Dunn's litigation and international arbitration practice group. He has extensive experience and focuses on international commercial arbitration the intersection of international arbitration and litigation and award and judgment enforcement. 
Zachary has represented clients before the International Centre for Settlement of, of Investment Disputes, the London Court of International Arbitration, the International Centre for Dis Dispute Resolution, and the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. His clients span all industries, and he has particular experience in complex contractual disputes, as well as cases relating to mining and energy projects. He has also worked on domestic cases and devoted significant time to pro bono projects working on behalf of aggrieved inmates and immigrants seeking asylum or other protections from removal. He earned his Joe Doctor cum laude in 2014 from the Georgetown University Law Center and received his Bachelor of Arts degree in International Affairs from the George Washington University in 2010. I will now turn it over to the speakers to provide an overview of their career paths. Um, including what motivated them, motivated them to pursue a career in international and how they landed up in their current job with the firm. Um, we will have, like, as I said, a dedicated Q&A session at the end of, of um, this, this webinar, um, but please feel free to post questions in the Q&A session as we go, Q&A function as we go along. And if they are relevant to the discussion, I will pose them to the speakers, otherwise we will return them to return to them in the end. Well, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the speakers. Um, I'm going to start, I know this is, I'm going to start with Zachary because he's on my screen first. <laughs> so I know it's usually ladies first, but today, because I think the ladies are in the majority, um, we'll give it over to Zachary. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I guess the question to start out <clears throat> was what motivated us to um, pursue career in international law and how we ended up here. Um, for me, it's kind of the only thing I, I found interesting in college was um, it's why I majored in international affairs and um, always enjoyed essentially studying history and the way it interacts with current events. Um, when I left law school, I knew I wanted to go to law school. Uh, sorry, when I left college, I knew I wanted to go to law school. And I saw a career in particularly international arbitration as the best way to combine um, the legal field that I felt comfortable in with my interest in international affairs. And uh, it turned out it turned out to be a good choice. It has been pretty much exactly what I expected. And um, so far, so good. Great, thank you, Zach. Um, I'm Anna. Thank you, Clea. Uh, I was I was also reading your background. I think uh, people interested in international law, we don't even have a choice. It's, it's like a vocation and it starts very early in life. In my case, I'm Spanish um, and I come from the southern region of Spain. Uh, it's a little bit isolated. We only speak Spanish. Uh, come from a rural area and I was able to see, for instance, how the, the funds flowing from the European Union were helping the region and I started getting interested in into that and uh, knowing uh, like international people, uh, politics, history was uh, at school my, my, also my favorite subject. So I studied one year of uh, political science in France and ended up in Brussels in the <laughs> bubble of uh, European Union affairs. Um, I enjoyed it very much there, and I started in the public sector, which we will cover in other meetings. But uh, I, I was able to find that in the public sector, um, things are a little bit more uh, rolling over what was done in the peer years. And in the in the private sector, when I started my career as a lawyer there in Brussels, I, I realized how we could take action in the in the moment according to the needs of our clients and. and uh, a little bit also even the, the, the legal framework, uh, having discussions with the, the lawmakers. Um, and then I wanted to go like more, more international uh, because I thought Brussels was the center of the world and, and came one year to America to just discover uh, how, how small Europe can, can be seen from, from here so for some, some of the issues I thought that we were probably leaving. I'm very happy to have taken this uh, this career. Um, it has uh, put me in touch with uh, with a complete different perspectives, uh, friends, and it's always challenging. I'm always learning and realizing how many stereotypes I still have, <laughs> but uh, it's a learning process. So I'm glad I'm I'm here in this position right now. Great, thank you. I think especially later, later I'll return to you to talk about being a foreign 
trained lawyer moving to the United States. I'm sure some of our um, audience will like to know about that, but thank you. Ashika. Thank, thanks so much, Clea. Actually, it's Ashika. I know it's tricky. It's not how you would expect it when you read it, but, and I have to commend you for your beautiful uh, French pronunciation of my firm's name, but we Americanize it and actually say Debevois. It's not, I wish it was Debevois as a French speaker myself. I think that sounds better, but um, it's Debevois and Plimpton. And um, I, it seems like a very similar experience from Zach and Anna. It sounds like international affairs, international law has been kind of a calling from a young age for all of us. I, even though I was born in the U.S., I spent a good amount of my childhood overseas, a few years in Canada, and about six years in Hong Kong, where I went to high school, and just developed an interest, I think, in international travel, international perspectives from those experiences. I remember in high school doing a Model UN conference, and rather than, you know, in the States, you'd go to maybe New York City and be doing it with a bunch of other American kids from nearby American high schools. And I did my first one in Beijing with kids from all over Asia. So you had people, you know, representing countries where they actually may be from or may have lived. And it was just an amazing experience and got me really interested in, in focusing on that kind of work. So I also went to college with a focus in international affairs and did a master's, as you said, after in international relations and went to NYU for law school specifically because of the strength of their international law program, particularly human rights. I, I never thought I would end up as a firm to answer your question about sort of how we ended up where we are. I started at a firm at another firm, actually, um, Cleary Gottlieb, and I thought I would work there for a couple of years, do some really fun human rights stuff pro bono, and then go on to work for in the public sector or for the UN or for an NGO or something like that, where I could focus more on human rights and humanitarian law, which were my primary interests. So I, I did. I went to the State Department, as you said, and did mostly uh, IHL and human rights work there. And then um, not to sort of impinge on ASIL's political neutrality, but we had what many in the U.S. felt was a somewhat unfortunate election in 2016. And my, um, I had actually already left state, but for a teaching fellowship, but my inability to return was somewhat related to that election and um, was talking to a, a partner who's one of the current co-heads of our international disputes group at Debevoise, Catherine Amirfar, who I had worked with at the State Department. She had been a political appointee there under the Obama administration. And she sort of floated, you know, why don't you come work with Devil Voice? We have a public international law practice. And I was like, ha, ah, that's funny. You know, firms always say that, but firms don't really practice public international law. How is that possible? And she was like, no, no, we do. Like we represent states in, in interstate disputes and in investor treaty disputes. And I think you'd find it very interesting. And when I looked into it more and came in and interview, interviewed, I realized like, oh, this is exactly the kind of work I had been hoping to do actually as a, as a junior lawyer, but never thought I could do at a firm, which is why I had left initially. So made my way back into private practice um, to work specifically in that practice. And it's been a really amazing experience so far. Thank you. Sorry, let me get your name right this time. Ashika? <laughs> Ashika, yes, perfect. Ashika, it's beautiful. <laughs> it makes more sense that way, Ashika. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing all your experiences. Um, I'm actually going to ask Anna, um, are there, I mean, you, do you think there's a specific educational professional path that are particularly beneficial um, for aspiring international lawyers that want to go into private practice? I know you, you started in, in the public international law and sort of moved over. Um, and yeah, if you just think, you know, do you think there's more of a direct way or what are your thoughts on, um, you know, specific educational professional um, paths? So uh, coming from Europe as a foreign trained attorney, um, I think it was useful having a numbers, number of years of experience um, to in order to show here that I could also give something. Uh, I think it's good not sometimes you can be hired being very junior, like 25, but in my case, it was more like 32, I believe. Um, I think that uh, that helped me in my case from what I saw from other peers in the LLM. I thought that uh, more junior profiles uh, uh, 
took it longer. It, it doesn't mean that it did, didn't get a job, but uh, they managed, uh, but it took them a little bit more time. I think uh, I, I could benefit a little bit from, from that, from developing um, like clients and contacts uh, in Spain, in Brussels. Uh, and then, of course, the, the process is for all of us the same. So you study an LLM, then you, you sit for the bar. Uh, the bar is it's very hard for foreign trained attorneys, I think. I didn't pass the first time, so I didn't give up. I went for a second time. I was lucky to, to be in a company where they allowed me to sit for a second time. And yeah, once uh, once in, always try to, to bring your value to the table. I think it's it was also very useful for me to speak uh, multiple languages. Uh, and provide like a little bit out of the box uh, thinking uh, in the cases I've been, I've been working on. Great, thank you. So it really seems that, you know, the more experience you have, even if it's not directly related uh, to, you know, the area that you're going into, it's really beneficial. Zach, what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, yeah, very similar thoughts and something um, Anna said um, kind of, with, um, you, you bring your experience. I think that there's really no one best or correct path to end up in, in a, a you know fulfilling career in international law, but you do need to be aware of what you bring to the table. So Anna, you know, from Spain has the European experience. Ashika has you know traveled, lived abroad, and has a, a lot of public international law experience. I don't have any of that, but it doesn't mean I don't also you know bring what what I bring. And that is, you know, I've done a good amount early in my career of New York state court and federal litigation. And if, if, if that's your experience, you just have to be aware that that is a value you can add to your case. And a good international law team will have people of all different backgrounds that add a lot of different things. And when you're sitting around the conference room in London or Paris or wherever, and somebody asks a question about how you would go about getting an injunction for, for some minor thing in New York, it's valuable to be the New York lawyer that knows how to do that, just as valuable as it is to be the person that can tell you how the European Commission will likely look at this or, or handle something. And I think that whatever your educational background is, the, the key thing is to think about what it taught you that you can bring to the table that might differentiate you and help you help with things move forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, I was going to give it to you. Yeah, <laughs> because, I was going to say, especially with human rights and arbitration, and you know, the, the, what are those? Um, how do they match together? I completely agree with what, what Zach was saying and also just about thinking about relevant experience in sort of a broader fashion because I went, I did not actually really do any of this sort of work immediately after law school. I went to Cleary hoping to do it and with the intention of doing it, but the way it worked at Cleary and it works this way at Devil Voice too, and I think it may at a number of other New York firms, international disputes or international arbitration, that sort of work on the billable side is part of the litigation practice. And as a junior litigation associate, you go into just a general pool of litigation associates and you're in that general pool for your first and second year. So you can express an interest in the international work, but if, you know, for whatever reason, maybe that that type of work is slow, or maybe they're not really doing it out of the office that you're in, um, you may not get staffed on those cases and you'll be staffed sort of where they need you. So I got to do one really interesting commercial arbitration when I was a summer associate and that sort of hooked me. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do when I go back to Cleary. I'm going to be flying to Hong Kong and Korea and all over the world to interview witnesses and doing arbitrations under the ICC rules. And, you know, the seat's going to be somewhere else in the world and the law is going to be of some other country and it's all going to be very international. And then I started at Cleary and for whatever reason, didn't get staffed on those cases and did securities litigation and bankruptcy. There was a lot of bankruptcy happening at the time around 2008, 2009. Um, I did a crazy, not crazy, but I mean, it was absolutely fascinating, a federal Indian law case related to um, a, a Native American tribe that wanted to build a casino on their reservation in the Hamptons and the state of New York and the town of Southampton sued them to prevent them from, from doing so. So, you know, a lot of domestic litigation experience, like Zach said, but also always keeping in my sort of ultimate goal and desire to work in the human rights IHL space. 
um, kept an eye out for pro bono opportunities where I could do that, or at least related work. So did a lot of pro bono work in that space. So then when I applied to the State Department, you know, you might think, well, you don't really have relevant experience, like maybe you took some international law classes, classes in law school, and you know, did some extracurriculars that showed your interest, but then you went to a firm for a couple years. I also did a domestic clerkship, an appellate clerkship, which you would think is also, you know, not really directly related to that type of work. But um, the State Department actually liked very much that I had a couple years of experience at a firm, even if it wasn't directly relevant experience, they felt like I kind of understood what it means to be a lawyer. And the State Department does get involved in a lot of domestic litigation in, in US courts. So those are relevant skills to have. Um, they liked the clerkship experience. And then they liked that I was able to show that I had a demonstrated interest because at least I could point to like, well, I took on this in this pro bono case because, you know, as you can see by my educational transcript, I was really interested in focusing on inter international work and I just wasn't able to do it as billable work at Cleary, but that doesn't mean that I didn't pursue, you know, whatever opportunities I had to keep doing that sort of work. So did human rights work as part of my pro bono practice. Great, thank you. Actually, can you share a little bit of your experiences from your from your early days when you were um, starting out? Can you share anything else, examples of cases or projects you have recently worked on um, in the field of international law? Sure. So I am currently doing, as I said, work that I, I never really expected to do at a law firm. Debevoise's international disputes practice has sort of three main areas, commercial, international commercial arbitration, investor state disputes, and public international law, which are sort of pure interstate treaty disputes, like before the International Court of Justice or UN treaty bodies or uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, that sort of thing. Um, I had been hoping to focus primarily on that last area, but came in with the understanding that I would work across all three practice areas. And it just so happened when I came in, we got sort of back to back to sort of massive um, interstate disputes. So we first represented Qatar um, in claims arising out of, you may recall it in 2017, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates broke off diplomatic ties with Qatar and put in all sorts of restrictions against Qatari businesses, Qatari individuals traveling to their countries um, out of sort of, they claimed it was due to Qatar's support for terrorism and financing of terrorism, but there was really sort of a deeper political diplomatic dispute underlying all of that. And so we brought claims on Qatar's behalf before the International Court of Justice, before the CERD Committee, which is the UN treaty body that administers the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, uh, before the ICAO Council, which is the Civil Aviation Authority in Montreal, because they were issues related to restrictions that these countries had placed on um, Qatari, Qatar Airways, for example, flying out of Qatari airspace into their airspace. I mean, it raised all sorts of really interesting international law issues from an interstate perspective. Um, and that was sort of the first couple years of my practice at Debevoise. And once that settled, sort of just before that settled, we um, were brought on to represent Azerbaijan in a range of disputes and claims it has related to its long running conflict with Armenia. Um, so again, we have another ICJ case, two ICJ cases actually, because Azerbaijan and Armenia both filed cases before each other. So I came in certainly expecting to do mostly commercial arbitration, maybe some investor state. And if I was lucky, you know, a sexy PIL case here or there, and I've worked primarily on ICJ cases and other interstate disputes only. Yeah, it's um, because it's interesting that despite it not being directly to human, right, human rights, there are some implications or thoughts that go into, especially with the Qatar and, you know, the, the sanctions that were imposed on that. And, you know, as a country, sanctions could have uh, human rights implications. So it must be in the back of your mind, at least, um, these implications it has, even though you're not directly, directly working on it anymore. Um, yeah, well, the, the funny thing is, I think you normally think of human rights cases as representing individual victims who have had their rights mm -hmm. violated, you know, usually by a, a government or sort of paramilitary mm -hmm. type authority. But these, the, the main cases in both the Qatar and the Azerbaijan um, cases are actually human rights cases because mm -hmm. they were brought mm -hmm. under the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of um, Racial Discrimination. So the argument mm -hmm. is that as a state, 
their the country is bringing claims against the other state that they claim has violated the human rights of its population and the state's mm -hmm. own rights under the treaty. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Great, thank you. Anna, can you share any experiences or examples of cases uh, that you're currently or have worked on recently um, that you sure. find particularly interesting? <laughs> So I, I was having some fun uh, listening to the to Hashika because I, I I was in the UAE part of the table <laughs> in that case uh, in the WTO and and also ICAO. Mm, my my experience so far has been that uh, it's important to learn to to surf the waves, um, being always updated with the with the reality that to not to lose track of what's going on in the world. I, I transited through different uh, practices. Originally, I was uh, doing a lot of antitrust when I was in Brussels, even some of the Google cases. And then I came here exactly at the moment when Trump uh, was uh, doing all the trade war against China. So I, I didn't want to lose my, my background on antitrust, but uh, I only got a chance to get into international trade. And it ended up being interesting and becoming more and more political than, than at the time it was uh, antitrust. And just from last year, I'm practically full time doing doing sanctions. Uh, I'm practically working with uh, with Russia uh, on, on Russia matters, uh, Cuba, Iran, and it's it's also getting, of course, very very political. Uh, but it might be that next year we don't have any more sanctions, so I will have to refresh and renew myself and turn. I don't know. So basically, I my 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 work for the WTO stopped existing because of the situation. Uh, the the appellate body of the WTO got got frozen because no no panelists were were elected from the US side. And then I was like, what am I gonna do? I've been doing this for, for the UAE for the last uh, year or so. And then I got sanctions. So maybe next year it will be another thing. So don't get too obsessed about uh, having one concrete dream or working in one specific uh, part of law. Of course, that's very respectful. I, I respect that. But uh, I think uh, having been flexible with the cases I have worked in uh, helped me to, to yeah, to, to continue moving, right? Because it's as a, as a foreign trained lawyer, it was not always easy to 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 fit the, in the market. Mm -hmm. So that's how I was able to, to shift from one thing to another. Yeah, I think for from both of what you said is uh, is this uh, influence that politics has on the on the law, right? And that's why it's so important to stay up to date um, because the two do not <laughs> they not don't exist either of them in a vacuum. Um, but great, Zach. Any any comments there or any experiences that you have had or projects that you're working on? Yeah, no, um, I think that I'll, I'll describe some projects, but I think that we're all kind of talking about a similar idea, same as we talked about with the education and background. When you come into practice, you might expect one thing, but if you got, if you keep your mind open to doing various different things, you'll kind of circle around the international sphere and land on the place where you fit best or is most interesting to you. So when I started at Gibson Dunn, the, and one of the reasons I came to Gibson Dunn is because I wasn't sure I wanted to do international arbitration. I hadn't done it before, so you never know if you're going to like it. And Gibson had a relatively small practice at the time, but we've, we've grown since then. Um, and I knew I could do other things. So I was you know, representing Sony Music and doing just Delaware contract disputes. But at the same time, I took on a, a dis an international arbitration a commercial dispute over the pricing of iron ore, which sounds maybe not interesting. I thought it was fascinating. And the client was very sophisticated and really taught, you know, helped teach us about their business. And we, it helped us in the case. Um, you know, that led to another dispute um, where we represented a U.S. energy company in a dispute with um, EDF, the French utility, over the sale of um, three nuclear power plants. Again, you need to learn the business, learn the commodity pricing structure. And you kind of something that's you know, similar across a lot of these commercial disputes is learning how the client's goods are priced. Um, and then that dispute, because you know that's a, a dispute over evaluation, we got a lot of really niche experience, led to a dispute representing Jay-Z in a, in a case against Bacardi for you know regarding the value of his cognac brand. And that's not very international. There were some international elements of it, 
But the point is your international experience and you know keeping an open mind to all these things sometimes leads to places you never expected. I started, you know, when I was 25 representing Sony Music and 10 years later representing somebody else in the music industry, but uh, in kind of a very different way because of the experience I got in between um, really learning about how these, you know, the use of international law and can, can the arbitration mechanism to you know, push negotiations in a certain way can be really helpful. Um, and then you just learn how to do it. Great. I think, yeah, it's really, I think the message here is be flexible, take what comes your way, way or as Anna says, ride the wave. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, one of the other questions that one of our um, audience now asked, and that I also wanted to ask you, in terms of that flexibility in in work of the projects you take on, you know, what about like work life balance um, and the flex how flexible you have to be in terms of, you know, your schedule and and work and life and yeah, Zach, if you could if you could kick us off with that. Yeah, so this is an interesting question. I mean, the general question of work-life balance, I think that in an international practice offers more pros than cons. Um, it's a fairly predictable um, life. In, well, I, I don't know about the trade and sanctions world that that it, I think can be a, a little bit more short term, but in the international arbitration, public international commercial disputes, you have fairly long timetables that are agreed in advance. Um, and that allows you to plan your, your life around it a little bit. Um, and also the time zones can be, they can be a, a negative, but a lot of times a positive because you'll have calls with clients, you know, when your family is asleep, which, you know, not great for you if you if you don't like staying up late or waking up early, but at least you can kind of organize those also around your schedule. Um, in terms of how do you set aside time to digest international issues, I don't think of that. Um, uh, I really don't make conscious time for that. And I think what you heard from all three of us is that we ended up in international law because this is what we were always interested in. So to you know, to the extent I digest international issues, that's it's because it's what I would I would do anyway. If I'm scrolling the news, I naturally go to the international section, right? Um, and obviously there's great resources like GAR and other you know kind of international law focused publications. But I, but I feel like I don't need to make conscious time for that. It does just sort of happen as a result of our interests and our cases that keep keep us updated. I will say that the pandemic sort of revolutionized this in a way and, and changed a lot of things. And it'll be interesting to see how many of those changes stick. I think in some ways things are sort of st slowly starting to shift back, but haven't fully yet. I'm thinking particularly about the extent of travel required. So in my group, at least, travel was sort of constant. People were always traveling either for business development, uh, to speak at conferences, you know, or for cases, you know, to interview witnesses because the client is based overseas to meet with the clients. Um, you know, the hearing is overseas or whatever it is. So there, there was a lot of travel. And honestly, that's one of the things that attracted me to this work in the first place was that I wanted travel. I wanted a firm where maybe I could even spend a couple of years in one of the overseas offices doing some work out of that office. Um, I, I still love to travel and, and I do appreciate that aspect of it, but I have a young son now who's four. And so the travel has sort of become less appealing to me in that aspect because it means time away from him. And it's very hard for me to think now, um, when we were representing Qatar, the client basically wanted us to open a Debevoise Doha office, which we couldn't really do, but we sort of did because they rented office space for us. And we had a team on the ground at all times. We had associates spending two weeks in Doha, coming back to New York for two weeks and sort of going back and forth and doing that. And at the time, before I had a child, like that was amazing. And I loved getting to know Doha and spending that much time with the client face to face and really getting to know them. And the representation of Azerbaijan started um, during the pandemic. So we, you know, weren't really able to travel to meet the client in, in the same way. Um, and we've gotten comfortable, I think, just across the practice, more comfortable with Zoom meetings. And also from a, like a cost perspective, I think clients are inclined to be like, well, if I don't have to pay for you to fly over here, if we can get this done over Zoom, then why not? So that is just one consideration I'd say that has sort of shifted for me and that you might have to take into account if you have a family or if you have young children that you don't want to leave for long periods of time. Like I said, because of the pandemic and the use of Zoom, I think there's a lot more flexibility in that now 
now than there used to be, but it's starting to, to shift back to the travel picking up again. So it's something to keep in mind. Great, Anna, do you yeah. have anything to add? Sure, um, I think uh, one of the advantages in the US is that uh, you can go as far as you want. If you wanna be working 20 hours a day, you can, but also you have to set your priorities clear. And I don't know if you wanna like uh, form a family, it's true that in the first years you put yourself, but I think there comes a moment where your team knows that you will get the job done. Um, and that you can also communicate. For me, the, the key is communication uh, and telling them where you're standing. For instance, for me, it was very important to, as a foreigner, to spend some time in Spain with, with my parents. Um, at the beginning, it was very difficult for me to get that. Um, but now I'm allowed to be working from there three weeks in summer, which is great. I still have grandparents in Spain. Um, um, yeah, the, the, definitely the pandemic helped a lot. I was originally based in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, with a boyfriend in New York, uh, got married. And I remember my boss at the beginning didn't want me to, to come to New York even for a day to, to work from the office. And we have an office in, in New York. But uh, after the pandemic, I think bosses have come to the, to the understanding that uh, you will work in any case. And they have been more and more flexible. So for me, the, the two keys are setting right uh, your priorities uh, and then communication. And once you have the communication, I think people can be very understanding. I, I had like a, a surgery one month ago. I had to take like a sick leave for, for two weeks. Uh, my boss respected it completely. There was one urgent thing, which of course was under one of my cases, which I needed to attend. So like a couple of hours one day I needed to connect. Uh, so you just, speak uh, about how you're feeling can you do this it's okay fine so that 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 would be my advice i think that it's important we are now in a in a generation where we really need to know what what we want we now have uh, technology to a level where it cannot be that the continuous progress leads us to more work instead of less uh, i think that uh, we also need to support each other uh, and i have said this too, because of course you're gonna find uh, very competitive people. And as a woman, I have had the question to some of my friends that were in the law firm, like sleeping and like, how can I form a family and compete against this other associate that it's killing herself? Um, so we have to take care of uh, one another. And I think that uh, basically it's more the pressure that we put sometimes on ourselves to show that we are doing as the other person that is staying longer than the actual pressure that exists in the city. At least that's that's my experience that sometimes we can really put pressure on colleagues depending on, on how we act and I think that I hope that um, our new generation of lawyers is, is gonna be a little bit less aggressive into in terms of like uh, competing of course anybody can do whatever whatever they want but uh, sometimes it can get uh, I have experienced that uh, it can get a bit uh, annoying I don't know what are your thoughts about that but it's uh, maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. C communication is key, and I think that a lot of in a lot of ways you can take advantage of the international nature of the role. A lot of domestic clients are going to have a lot of questions between like five p.m. and seven p.m., which is a time I like to be at home having dinner with my kids and, and putting them to bed. My international clients, they're asleep. They're in Asia, Europe, whatever. It's the end of their day, and if you communicate that you know you're going to go home and have dinner with your family. Uh, it's okay to then you know finish things up at nine o'clock. It, it's no difference. The client's asleep, um, but communicating is key, and that you can make the time for yourself and take advantage of the different time zones um, to work when it makes sense to work and to do other things when you need to do those things. Right. Yeah. That setting of boundaries, um, and I think like Anna said, the, the, we're the generation that's getting a little bit, <laughs> a little bit better with that. Hopefully, um, <laughs> we'll see, and we'll have to see if we, we, if this, you know, with COVID, this new way of life on Zoom, and you know, there's a lot of debate whether it's better or worse, or um, so we'll have to see if it, if it sticks. Um, I just want to ask. Uh, I'll return to some of the questions asked in the, in the Q and A now, but. In terms of so some of the soft skills that were already mentioned, the sort of flexibility and uh, setting boundaries and communication. 
I'd like to go a little bit back to other soft skills that you could recommend um, that people could develop or work on, but also, you know, harder skills in terms of the sides for obvious law degree <laughs> and experience. Um, are there other further education courses you'd recommend or would you just say just read and as much as, as, as you possibly can? Um, I'll open the floor to whoever wants to go first. I, I personally have encountered some difficulties uh, because of my lack of uh, financial background and economic background. For instance, in, in international trade where you really have to databases, uh, accounting, uh, books of the company sitting together to see the, the financial results over the last years, costs analysis. Um, I, I was not expecting that. It's difficult once you are working to take the time to go back to study, but it's always necessary. Um, other than that, uh, I think for me, it was very useful, my, my background in, in uh, uh, political studies and also my experience uh, with uh, international institutions like European Parliament, and I have done some projects for the World Bank. Uh, it's always good to, I believe, to not stick to one boss only because uh, they will provide you the same corrections. It's good being in a team where you get input from different people. And for me, it was even important to switch law firms. I have been working with Germans. I know how Spaniards work. And now I'm working with Americans. It's a very different style. Um, and that's completely different from pursuing like a separate master's, but in the law firm, you also learn. And you can have uh, people with different backgrounds that provide you with input and that can make you uh, better, I think. Yeah. Chime in, because I think it would answer one of the questions somebody um, asked. You know, Anna said, she lacked it at some point some um, financial background and somebody said how would you get into international law from the financial services sector talk to your colleagues that are in are doing international projects i guarantee you there's something about their case they don't understand that you do and maybe you're not working on the entire case but you can add a lot of value with with the financial services knowledge and sometimes we'll bring people in from our corporate group to work um, on an international arbitration because they know this deal structure, you know, and the, and the way it, it's relevant in our case. And I think that, again, you bring what you know, and then you'll learn the new stuff, and then you'll know that too. And they, it kind of snowballs from there. And regarding that question that was made in the Q&I, um, law firms have teams uh, across different uh, specializations. Like for instance, in international trade, we have uh, CPAs that are analysts and participate in the legal cases, but provide uh, the accounting knowledge. And they are not lawyers, but they are part of the cases. So when we go for a verification, uh, they come with us and they are a key member of our teams. So if you are not a lawyer, you're working in finance and you wanna move, think of positions that maybe can like international trade, for instance, is a good one, corporate, as I mentioned. Um, and I think in terms of building up your skills, there's really no substitute for trying to get some practical experiences and sort of what experiences and how you go about get them kind getting them kind of depends on you know where where you currently are um and what you're doing if you're still a student you know in addition to just taking relevant courses at your school and looking into relevant extracurriculars you can join organizations like ASL and you can join ASL interest groups and you can help contribute to say they're putting together a panel or trying to put together you know a blog post or an article there are lots of ways you can contribute to get more practical experiences, even as a student, you know, are you interested in human rights work and you want to get some practical experience as a student, jo join your law firm's human rights clinic if they have one. Um, if you're currently an, an associate, for example, at a firm or you're already working, you know, the, the I think the same rationale in terms of um, joining organizations like ASIL and getting involved that way still applies. You know, if you can join an interest group, you can start to work on a panel, start to work on an article. I think rather than just sort of, you know, trying to put together a syllabus for yourself and, and reading up on the relevant law, having concrete experiences like that that you can point to are a lot more helpful and a lot more valuable. Yes, I guess one can't put a, a list of things that one has read 
on a CV. <laughs> right. um, but yes, I, I would second absolutely getting involved with, with ASIL. I'd also recommend personally from my side, the International Law Association that has many commitments. So you find one, a branch uh, in your country um, and they often, and the International Law Association has committees that work on different topics that you could get involved in. Um, that's just from my side. But if there are any other recommendations in terms of that, otherwise we'll answer some of the questions. Okay, um, so I think we answered the one about, you know, for financial services and moving into international law. Um, here's one I think I would like to pose to Anna, um, just as what is your advice to foreign trained lawyers currently applying to your law firms or to law firms in general? Um, just a little bit about the hiring in terms of that. Um, as I said before, if, if you can bring like a, contacts or clients or try to connect with your uh, peer firm and seek points of potential like counseling that was helpful in my case um i the manner i entered in court is because uh, my peer firm is co-counseling in the spanish olive case in the, in the u.s concerning the tariffs by by trump I ended up not working as much in that case i'm doing much more sanctions at the moment but that was the the manner i could connect and uh, um, and of course you need to do like a lot of networking while while you're in the LLM uh, don't be afraid or shy to ask for help to connect via LinkedIn to try to have a coffee my experience is that sometimes people can be responsive by just hey I, I just need help do you want to have like a lunch with me just to give me some advice instead of directly uh, submitting CVs um, I have seen that people are usually more, more available to, to make the time to have a coffee. And then probably that person wants to see your faces, then it's going to connect you with someone else that maybe will connect you to someone else. And that's that's how it, it works. Um, what are the advice will I give? Um, it's pass, pass the bar, pass the bar. Passing mm -hmm. the bar is, is a tough point, but it's, it's necessary. I think that uh, while you are working without the bar in the US, uh, you are sort of like a paralegal, in between legal clerk, and you cannot have a proper career without the, the bar. You get a little bit like stuck uh, in terms of salary and progression. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. I think uh, uh, be open to... Um, move i am i for instance i really wanted to stay because i i made my current husband at the time so i, I started opening in my linkedin profile uh, possibility to go to washington i really wanted to stay in new york i couldn't uh, the, the job i got was in washington dc so be open also to to look for other cities uh, to go to california if you are doing like international law it's easier for us to to move because we are not practicing as much under state law um, and I think that that was an important point for me. My geographic scope was even open to going to Mexico, for instance, uh, as a part, part of NAFTA, probably then going here and getting like additional um, training uh, in this side of the Atlantic. So that, that was one of the options I considered. Uh, so I think that's that's how that's how I did. I was pretty open to to do whatever was needed in order to, to, to stay, to be honest. So I, I accepted also, unfortunately, at the beginning, it happens to, to international attorneys, uh, a low salary. I started as an intern, despite I had like seven years experience in Brussels. Huh? That, that these things happen. So uh, be humble, take it. And as we said before, it's, it's a question of priorities. For me, my priority mm -hmm. was uh, starting a family. I met this guy who, who ended up being my, my husband. So for me, it was clear that uh, giving a step back will be giving a step forward after. Great, thank you. Um, Zach, would you answer the question um, about entry-level positions? Um, so one of our audience feels that a lot of the positions require multiple years of experience. Um, is there anything you can can add to that? Um, well, I, I think I'm I'm a good example of the fact that you don't necessarily need a lot of experience to end up in a career in international law. But I do think that if you are coming in with no experience, you may it, 
may benefit from not you know insisting on only doing one thing because you don't really have a great argument for only doing that thing you're not an, you don't have a, some developed expertise in it um you know experience doing exactly the 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 thing it, it is you you think you want to do um so be open try to do it maybe try to apply to a firm that does what you want certainly do that maybe try to apply to an office where they focus in a region you're interested in Gibson Dunn doesn't really work that way, but some firms will have, you know, subgroups that are really just do Latin America focused arbitration, uh, Europe, it, it, it depends on, you can look into the firm and see how they're organized and apply on that basis. But if they, you know, like Ashika said, um, if you come in and you do some bankruptcy work, that's okay. It's going to be really valuable one day to your international law practice, because you're going to be representing a bankrupt entity whose assets were expropriated by well, in my in my case, a lot of companies uh, companies that were expropriated by Venezuela, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it will be relevant. And I would say that you know don't let a lack of experience keep you from applying to the place you want, but also don't let your you know your interest keep you from getting the experience that will actually help you move ahead. Yeah, yeah and it it depends a bit on the firms that you're applying to because many big firms like Dabovois and Cleary, and it sounds like Gibson Dunn is the same, don't have entry-level positions specifically in you know, international arbitration or international dispute resolution or public international law. You come in as an entry-level associate in our litigation group with an expressed interest in those areas, and that's perfectly fine, and you should be very clear and vocal about that interest so that you get staffed on those sorts of cases. Um, but you know, we're not we hire primarily JD, US JDs right out of law school. So we're not expecting them to have any sort of relevant experience other than what they might've been able to do in the one or two summers during law school before they came to us for, mm -hmm. for a, a first year associate position that is. Right, so I think that we've spoken about this before, don't pigeonhole yourself, be willing to do <laughs> everything and anything possible from the beginning, um, international law. Uh, also, again, does not operate in a, in a vacuum and you will gain experience um, in it nonetheless. Thank you. I'm trying to see if there's any other questions. We can, we've can. we got time for one more question. Um, there's one question here. Could you please explain what typical notable difficulties um, they encountered in the international commercial sectors, which books do not explain? So I think maybe just some challenges that you faced um, in your careers, um, just in general. Anna? For me, a challenge has been the, the international environment uh, in, as such. Uh, right now, for the, for instance, for the, for the sanctions work, I'm working with, with two Russians, one Japanese, one Egyptian, an American, um, well, and, uh, and an Englishman. Um, it's, it's hard to, to sometimes understand the dynamics and the cultural background and the manner different people work and how different people communicate or not communicate when you assume that <laughs> you have to communicate. Like one stupid thing, I, I circulated a draft a couple of weeks ago. My Japanese colleague came in, made some edits, and I was never aware of those edits. And I was waiting for the partner to give uh, the, the, the like the approval to my draft. And he was like, "No, I don't. I don't have a clean version. Like it has some comments in the margin." And unfortunately, like my Japanese colleague didn't didn't tell me. And sometimes. I'm a Spaniard, I'm very outspoken. I, I will call by Zoom, hey, how are you doing? Uh, reach out. But some, some people don't, and don't, don't assume that everybody thinks like you think, <laughs> even in the most <laughs> obvious thing that you will assume. And of course I have, very, very stupidly, but I, in my team, I, I have like also um, an economist, an analyst um, from, from Asia, I think is South Korean. Um, I, he was, not replying to my emails, but only to emails that came from guys. I noticed, and I was like, "What?" Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised, and I had to call him. Like, you know, I'm reviewing your work, so we have to communicate and sit together, have a coffee, uh, and maybe it's just because uh, he was intimidated. I know I'm not gonna say that uh, it was racism as, as such, but. Uh, 
try to, as stupid as this might sound, almost like in garden uh, environment, but I think it's it's important to sometimes just go for lunch with the team and make sure that there are going to be frictions between colleagues because of uh, competi- internal competition, because of uh, lack of communication. So try to make friends out of your colleagues. We spend a lot of time in the in the law firm, uh, and now it's even more difficult because some days, like today, I'm working from home. I'm not with them, so you really need to make the effort to try to sit together with them and and let's let's make out of it like a, a good experience and a, and, a, and a good time. And one day we live this career, we live with friends, not with competitors. So um, I think it's it's a challenge to to work in a team. This is. It's a question that comes in all the interviews, but it's a challenge. It's, I find it difficult in, in this international environment. Even after all the years of Zoom, I still sometimes forget to unmute my <laughs> mute button. Any other um, comments on that, you know, challenges that you, you faced? I think one of the most challenging aspects of my job is actually one of the things I sort of enjoy the most about it as well, which is that the disputes I work on tend to be unfolding in the context of some sort of broader political dispute between the parties or even an armed conflict. So in addition to the specific legal issues that are arising in the case that we're working on, we have to keep yeah, we, you know, with, with a state as a client that's embroiled in this broader dispute, we have to keep our eye on those political issues and keep those under consideration as well. And there are definitely differences in dealing with a state as a client as opposed to you know, maybe a, a corporation um, or a domestic company. Uh, or even in a multinational corporation, because they, it's sort of like playing multidimensional chess. They have to be thinking about their domestic audience, but also their relationship with international partners and also their international legal obligations and how those interact with their domestic legal obligations. So there's lots of layers of, of complexity to it. Um, and I, I, it's very challenging in that sense, but I actually enjoy that aspect of it a lot. Back. No, I, I don't. Have, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I agree with 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 everything. Yeah. I mean, you really have to learn whatever you're working on. Maybe it, it doesn't seem like the thing you're interested in, but if you learn about it, you learn about the political situation in your client's country or in the country where your your dispute, um, you know, happens to to deal with. You to follow the some Twitter accounts, like you know, subscribe to some newsletters about the thing you, that you were not previously interested in, and that knowledge will be really valuable. And the cultural differences, like Anna mentioned, you've got to take those into account. You've got to be flexible. Um, and I will also say that I have seen that sort of like not responding to women um, happen sometimes, particularly outside the U.S. And I would say that if you're if you're a, a woman getting involved, is not acceptable. So don't don't accept it. And if you're a man on a team and you see that happening. Don't accept it. Don't just say, okay, I'll handle those conversations. Say, you know, my colleague on asked you some questions and let them, you know, overcome that because it's not, um, you do, you do see that a little bit, a little bit more, I think in a practice and it, it's changing, but I think you have to just be willing to be like on a set friends with your, with your colleagues. And that means supporting them. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I think that, um, it's a very strong message to, to end on <laughs> is, uh, supporting your colleagues. And also I, I would like to add, and this was already mentioned by Ashika and a few others about the importance of networking. Um, so not just within your firm, but that's why I'd recommend you all to get more involved in ASIL, <laughs> ASIL events. And, you know, if you see the emails going out and, you know, join, join any online events, in-person events, study groups, you know, whatever, whatever's out there. I think that's quite important. Well, that brings us to the end. Um, and I just want to thank for a very interesting discussion. And I hope uh, I hope our audiences um, enjoyed it and that we could answer most, most of your questions. There were some very interesting questions in the chat. And if you find your questions very personal, please email me. I'd have put my email, email in the chat function. Um, and I'll try to answer it or pass it on to one of our lovely speakers um, if they have the time to respond to it as well. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ashika. Thank you, Zach, for joining us here today. Thank you. And of course, the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.